Hello, everyone. I'm Lidvina Kuli. I'm a postdoc researcher at Lund University, Sweden, and also affiliated with Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And I would like to present on amyloid peptidase, which, who, and how, and with a particular focus on the how, because I do think there are some methods that we now have quite established, which we might not be utilizing optimally yet in our clinical routine, but also some new methods out there that could also maybe even add to our clinical uh, use of amyloid pet traces. But uh, these are my disclosures. And I first want to start with a question of the lay of the land. Uh, so for you, do you use amyloid pets in the clinical workup? Never, sometimes, often, or always included as part of your standard workup. So in the live presentation, we saw that we often had, well, often and sometimes filled in. Um, so amyloid pet is more and more used in the clinical routine, which is not maybe on a standard workup basis yet. But this, things might change, of course, in the near future, considering all the developments in the anti-amyloid trials that Frederick already alluded to. So to start with the first question, which? What are the amyloid pet traces that we have available and which one should you use? Uh, the three commonly used F18 traces are flutamatamol, flobetaben, and flobetapir, which you can see here. They all have their own visionary guidelines and slight uh, differences in how we assess them in terms of color scale or signs that you look at. But in essence, they're all FDA and EMA approved for clinical use because they bind to what we're interested in, which is amyloid beta plex. And despite the having some slight different kinetics, they all have shown very high agreement with post-mortem uh, data for this purpose. And also, importantly, they also show high comparison to the gold standard, uh, which is in the first developed amyloid pet tracer called Pittsburgh Compound B, or PIP. If you focus on the diagnostic performance on the right side of the curve, there's a high percentage agreement between the F18 tracers and the PIP tracers. So how do we use these different radio tracers in our routine clinical use? And the common actually reference center is what we call visual assessment of the scans. So visual assessment has a few uh, um, important steps to take into account where we're uh, assessing these scans. And the first one is proper orientation of the image. So our proper orientation of the image is key because otherwise you might be looking into white matter while of course we're interested in signal in the gray matter. Uh, because all F18 tracers uh, and even also PIP, but particularly the F18 tracers to a certain extent have off-target binding or noise signal in the white matter. And it's something you wanna discard. So a few things that we do is that we uh, orient the scan according to the anterior posterior plane, as you can see on the top, where there's a straight line between the anterior cor uh, corpus callosum and the posterior corpus callosum. The midline should be completely straight and you should align the temporal lobes. When this orientation is done, you can scale your image to know what is the off-target or reference signal that you're looking at. So in case of flutamatamol, you scale to the pons, where we always see high uptake, as you can see in the top negative scan indicated here. So you scale to 90% intensity of the pons, while for better ben and for better p, you scale to the deep white matter and 90% of that signal. Then you assess the individual regions, which are the frontal, lateral temporal, percutaneous, lateral parietal, and striatum region in case of flutamatamol. So the striatum can only be, it's only part of the visionary guidelines in flutamate the mole PET scans, while for the other two, it's the first few. And the classification of the image is actually relatively straightforward. It's, re it's considered positive when one of these regions is abnormal in uh, unilaterally. So if you just have in one hemisphere, one region abnormal, that is considered to be a positive scan. So a question to the audience, which scan do you, do you think shows abnormal uptake or is positive? Scan one. Scan two, both scans are positive, or neither scan is positive. What do you think? And the correct answer actually is that both scans are positive. In scan one, you can see some uh, early uptake uh, in the frontal regions, but you can see both on the first image here in the axial view and here in orbital, orbital frontal view, while scan two is more advanced positive. So what I want to indicate with these two examples is that both these scans are will be visually assessed as positive, but you could appreciate the huge range or differences between them in the extent of pathology. And this is information we're not using yet into the clinical routine, but might actually be very useful. So one of the few things that has been updated recently was already also uh, shown by my colleague Alex, 
was the updated appropriate use criteria, which has been presented this year at the Alzheimer Association Imaging Consortium in, 20, in this summer in 2023. And this uh, proposal has updated the use for which uh, patients or which subjects it is considered to be useful to have Emily PET or Tau PET during clinical routine. Um, during the clinical routine. The one thing I want to focus on is that they mention that we can inform prognosis of patients presented with mild cognitive impairment due to clinically suspected AD pathology. And you can see that actually, while before AMOIP was purely used as a diagnostic tool, it's now being considered to actually could be useful as a prognostic tool as well. And this is where the extent of pathology might come into play, which I mentioned in the previous slide. So what is the evidence so far that we have for amyloid pet based risk stratification? So in the war, in the years of staging models that we had in the past few years, people have attempted to use the extent of pathology, the regional information that we have in amyloid pet scans to state subjects according to the extent of burden. This is one of the first uh, models that came out from Bernard Hansu and colleagues, where they simply staged someone where they had cortical uptake, striatal uptake, or both. And what you can appreciate, particularly in those with mild cognitive impairment, is there's a sort of stepwise effect of amyloid burden on risk of cognitive decline. And subsequently, other staging models came out um, that tried to uh, describe the cortical distribution a bit more, see if there's more information to be gained. And for example, a model by myself as well, what you can see here, we so showed that if you stage according to cortical amyloid burden in the acne cohort, which are also mainly MCI subjects, you could already appreciate also the stepwise effect of the extent of, of pathology and the risk of cognitive decline. So that brings us to how could we further improve our use of this modality in our clinical routine. Um, Quantification has been recently suggested to really that could support visual assessment and maybe also a risk stratification. So beyond, uh, especially in those cases where visual assessment might be more tricky. So these are two examples of large studies that have recently been published, one for Flutamate more, one for Forbeta Ben, where the visual assessment has been compared to uh, quantification measures, either across a, a few uh, large cohorts on the left or across different softwares on the right. And what we can appreciate is that the agreement between visual assessment and quantification is very high in a more clinically advanced cohort, which brought a lot of uh, several studies to conclude that quantification could be useful in the support of visual assessment. But as you know, we do not live in a perfect world. Uh, this is work from uh, in Amsterdam with the ABI cohort, which not only captures the advanced clinical population, but also those are subjective cognitive decline. So basically, we have the full range of patients that we could see uh, in a clinical, uh, in a memory clinic. And here you can see the visual assessment color-coded against uh, a, a quantification measure constantiloid. And you can see there's not a perfect agreement between the two measures, though the agreement was definitely very high. Similar things have been shown for Futamatamol, or by our colleagues in, uh, in the States, with the idea study for Forbetapir. One thing that all, all these three studies have in common is that they've been utilizing the centeloid method, um, as it is a has been shown to be a measure that reflects the extent of pathology. The centeloid method has been introduced by Klonk and colleagues in 2015, and what basically it means is that it uh, scales a quantification measure to a common scale. So while an SUVR of 1.4 in one side with one particular tracer on a scanner does not mean the same as 1.4 in a different site with a different trace in a different scanner. A centeloid of 50 means exactly the same between different sites, scanners, and traces, or even reference regions, as shown in this plot. Uh, within the AMIPAD consortium, we've been uh, stress testing the centeloid concept to see if how robust it actually is and if it um, uh, indeed uh, measures the extent of pathology uh, as well as it, as it says it, it does. So we compared to 32 pipelines, think of MNI space, native space, different reference regions, different reconstruction settings, and the overall results actually that the measure is very robust. Um, the paper is currently under review, but if you're interested, it's available by archive. You can see the reference here. And then recently also a, a nice review came out that showed that when Centler was compared to different reference populations, different reference data sets, that actually very um, that uh, cutoffs for specific disease stages were robustly identified across these different approaches. So when we compare, for example, to neuropathology, we saw that a value of 10 or 12 and below 
um, indicates the absence of amyloid beta plugs, while the, the value of 30 or above indicates a high confidence of having a beta pathology in the brain, while 50 central, for example, was related to a clinical pathological diagnosis. So a lot of studies are now ongoing to understand what is happening in more so-called gray zones, so between 12 and 30, when can we say there's reliable amyloid pathology or there's an increased risk for someone to get amyloid pathology. But I think it's quite striking that a number of these studies have investigated this method from a different angle and find very uh, similar cutoffs. So because of these um, hypotheses and, and uh, uh, ideas of quantification supported visual assessment, we actually set out to be the first prospective study to see what actually happened to a visual assessment of difficult cases when we give the readers quantitative results. So what we did, we selected cases from the ANIPA Diagnostic and Patient Management Study, which is the DPMS, uh, which includes over 800 subjects from subjective cognitive decline until dementia, so the full clinical range uh, across uh, Europe. And we selected a subsample of 85 MLO PET scans for which the local reader had a low confidence, so that meant a three or below on the five-point Likert scale, or the visual assessment by the local reader was discordant with the amyloid status based on sensor and we used a cutoff of 21. In addition, we added some purported negative and positive cases across the two traces. So we have glutamate small and forbid to bend in this study. And we ended up with 101 cases um, to balance the beta, data set a bit. Then five trained and certified readers assessed all the scans before and subsequently again after a disclosure of the quantitative results. And the quantification was provided by AmiPipe, which is a modified version of Cortex ID. Um, which is a PET-only pipeline that provides a central and regional set scores. And it's modified because it does not only include a reference data set for flutamatamol, but now also for flubeta ben. Our main result in this work was that global sensloid and regional set score quantification was considered to be supportive of visual read and a, sub well, a substantial number of percentage of cases. Um, and after disclosure of the quantitative results, we saw an improvement of the concordance between the readers from a kappa of 0 0.65 to 0 0.74. And remember, this is like the most challenging uh, collection of scans that we can have in a clinical population. So achieving a kappa of 0 0.74 was quite impressive. I was, I was happily surprised. And an increase of reader confidence from the a, a score of 4 to 0.4.3. And all this together becomes uh, even more important to think of the recent developments in anti-amyloid trials, where we see that uh, sensloid is not only used now as an inclusion measure, but also as an outcome measure of the effect of the, of the anti-amyloid drug. Um, and considering it's an inclusion measure and with the hope that these drugs will become available in the upcoming time also in Europe, it might be extremely key to have our, our readers and, and, and users of amyloid pets familiarize themselves with a measure like Centeloid, that by the time it becomes mandatory, we already know how to work with it. So then a question again to you, to the audience, and I hope I could show, illustrate a bit to you when quantification could be of use. Um, with this particular case, would you request quantitative results for this amyloid PET scan? Yes, and as a standalone measure? Yes, but in conjunction with visual read, no visual read is sufficient. In the live presentation, we saw a bit of a mix between answer B and C. And that is a sort of what I wanted to indicate, that this is a more uh, advanced uh, uh, positive case where quantification might not be considered to be uh, needed, especially when you have a trained reader. What about this one? Would you like to request quantitative results for this amyloid PET scan? Yes, and as a standalone measure. Yes, but in conjunction with visual read, no visual read is sufficient. And with this question during the live presentation, we saw that mainly uh, answer B was provided. Uh, this is indeed an example of a more early um, uh, amyloid positive case. So you just see a little bit of the orbital frontal cortex and definitely uh, having a quantitative um, confirmation of this suspicion would be uh, very nice. You can see, you can see the difference between the two. And the final point I would like to make is that now I've shown you how quantification could be helpful uh, in terms of supporting visual assessment. It gives us an indication of the extent of, of pathology, but it's still something we're not using yet. Uh, this is work, uh, again, from the Amsterdam group 
where we showed that uh, based on clinical stage, so SED, MCR, dementia, uh, you would expect a certain extent or burden of amyloid pathology. And you can appreciate a stepwise increase that we're observing here for the AD cases in the, in the red colors. Um, this is definitely more work needs to be done here. But this is the first indication, maybe the extent of pathology can also provide us an indication if we were looking at uh, a primary etiology or co-pathology. For example, if you get a dementia patient who has amyloid positivity, but only in the precuneus with, let's say, a centroid of only 25, are you looking at a dementia due to AD or are you looking at a co-pathology that also is there present? And you should maybe look further into the um, primary driver of the cognitive impairment of this particular patient. As I said, this requires further uh, studies, but I think that will be a very relevant question to answer. And finally, what about heterogeneity? Um, as just, there's many staging models, and I've shown some pictures where uh, you see quite a stable trajectory of which region seems to become abnormal first. But I myself am a, I'm a trained reader. I've seen many uh, amyloid PET scans. And I, I observed uh, often, especially in the cognitively unimpaired subjects, that we have people had early uptake in the frontal regions, in the percunial regions, and the subset has occipital uptake, which is not even included in the visual read guidelines at the moment, and most quantification approaches as well. And in this work, we actually applied a data-driven model to over 3,000 amyloid PET scans and found evidence for three subtypes of, of spatial temporal trajectories. And with first indications showing some demographic differences between these and some genetic risk. And it is actually the focus of my current work to understand these subtypes and their clinical utility. The take home messages of this presentation are we have several FDA and EMA approved radio traces that are available to reliably measure amyloid beta pathology in vivo. Amyloid PET can improve risk certification of cognitive decline beyond binary classifications. Visual assessment of amyloid PET images could be supported by quantification, and this is particularly the case in challenging cases or a census where you have less experienced readers. And as I mentioned, quantification might become key in upcoming years, uh, considering the recent developments in anti-amyloid therapies, and we need to familiarize ourselves with these approaches before they become mandatory. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening. I'd like to thank the organization for inviting us to present this. And of course, my uh, biofinder group and the Amsterdam UMC. Thank you very much.